Amen. Good morning, everyone. Just a reminder, you can now take notes for the, for the sermon in the app if you'd like to open up and do that. Some people are excited about doing that. Um, see if you recognize this quote. Wisdom is chasing you, but you're running faster. Anybody recognize that or see that somewhere? Where do you see it? On the water guy, yeah, on Swan Pike. Uh, if you're driving toward Boyertown, that's on the sign. It's been there for a while. It usually changes them out. But, but that quote, it caught my eye, and it's been there for a while. And now it's, it's really a part of what this sermon is really going to be about. I don't know the origin of it, but it's true. Wisdom is chasing after you. And we just keep... To, we, keep, we seem to keep running faster and faster, trying to outrun it. But wisdom, in its best sense, wisdom personified is chasing after you. The wisdom of God in whose image we are made is trying to get your attention and calling you to run with the wind instead of against the wind. So I Googled the phrase, and the one response was on X, and it said, I don't have time for a nitwit and cretin like you. That was the response to it. I don't know. So if that's what you're thinking, then this sermon's probably not for you, but we're going to focus on the wisdom of God and that it is chasing after you, that he is chasing after you, and I pray that God will get your attention some other way. Um, here's another quote, and if you recognize it, don't say where it's from. You can tell me on, the, on your way out, but it's another quote that's true. Truth is truth. The quote is, dark and difficult times lie ahead. Soon we must all face the choice between what is right and what is easy. That's true. I think that's the kind of thing that's coming. We need spiritual wisdom because of what's coming to be able to discern between what is right and what is easy. Wisdom presents itself as our ever-present friend and also a skill to be learned, to be trained, to practice. And our scripture today, we'll take a look at it, it kind of sets this up really well. Um, from Ecclesiastes 7, I'm just going to look at the first seven verses initially. Um, I'm going to read it. In my vain life, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Be not overly righteous, and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this, and from that withhold not your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. Wisdom gives strength to the wise man more than ten rulers who are in a city. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does, not, who does good and never sins. Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. Now, and then the next line says, all of this I have tested by wisdom. We look at that and you hear a lot of things that people typically say. Kind of the, the feeling or the, the, the angst of the world. It's very common thoughts like the righteous seem to suffer and the, the, the wicked are able to thrive. Why is this happening? Don't overdo trying to be too, too wise. Like if you, if you put too much thinking in it, you're just going to burn yourself out. And there's, there's actually a little bit of truth to that. That's a little bit of what's behind the idea of having the hope, uh, the verse of hope. The idea on the app to have one verse, to read a verse and to look at it five different ways during the week. Read one verse, meditate on it often, rather than reading lots of verses and then forgetting what you read. You ever read a lot of stuff and then you, you don't even remember what you read? Or if you're reading a lot of things and then you don't even remember where you read something, some, sometimes there is some wisdom in reading less and meditating on it more over and over again, looking at it from many different ways. So I think that, that there's some wisdom in that for sure. Then it says, wisdom gives strength to the wise man, more than ten rulers. I think wisdom does give strength better than like city council. You can have as many people on city council, and I don't know what the way they make decisions in cities is today, but the, the wisdom of God can be more impactful than the wisdom of ten rulers and do not take to heart, uh, well, then, then it says, you know, nobody's perfect. We, this this license, we kind of give ourselves license to uh, 
for when we make mistakes, we say, well, nobody's perfect. And that's kind of what he's saying there. That, and there's, there's wisdom in just understanding that, no, nobody's perfect. But that isn't license to do whatever we want and to, we're in a feeling that we're getting away with something. Um, and do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows many times you have set yourself have cursed others. Do you really want people to be paralyzed by zingers you have said to them? I mean, think about it. I know in my life I have said things to people. I do not want them to be paralyzed by things I've said to them. And nor do you want to be paralyzed by things that people have said to you. Um, and all this I have tested by wisdom. I said, I will be wise but it was far from me. So he's kind of testing these things, all these, these kind of things that are happening in life, and he tested them. I think he's, he's thinking by the wisdom of God, but it seems far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it? That's in verse 23 and 24. And then 25, he says, I turned my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom and the scheme of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. And I find something more bitter than death, the woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. It's the personification of natural wisdom, the schemes of men. And then the personification of, of natural wisdom is personified. It's like the Delilah complex. Um, earthly wisdom personified in snares and nets and whose hands are fetters that grab us. Then he says, he who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Behold, this is what I found, says the preacher, while adding one thing to another to find the scheme of things. There's that word scheme again, the scheme of things, which my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have, found, I have not found. One man among a thousand I, I found, but a woman among all these I have not found. See, this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they, but they have sought out many schemes. Now, initially, God made us good and upright, and the fall came. And since the fall, we have started a long trail of scheme after scheme of trying to do it on our own, in our own strength, in our own wisdom, the Frank Sinatra way, doing it my way, the scheme, coming up with ideas. And so what we find ourselves doing is contrasting these two ideas of wisdom, and it's all throughout Scripture. Earthly wisdom, the natural wisdom, and heavenly wisdom, what comes from above, what is godly wisdom, and learning to discern. Wisdom is chasing after us. Godly wisdom is chasing after us. And it becomes the difference between schemes of our own doing become our undoing. The schemes of our own doing, if it's all about what we're doing, that's what becomes our undoing because we're relying on ourselves. But the plans God has for us, ah, that's his doing. When we start to think about what his doing is, 1 Corinthians uh, 1.30 says, By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That's the wisdom of God. Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God in the flesh. Proverbs also personifies this wisdom as a woman. So not only mentions it there, or the, the, the evil or the natural kind of wisdom, but Proverbs emphasizes in, in Proverbs 8 the woman being of godly wisdom. In every circumstance, does not wisdom call for you? And understanding, lift her voice on the top of heights, beside the way, where the paths meet, she takes her stand. In other words, everywhere, at every intersection, at every point in life, she takes her stand at the city gate, at the entrance of doors where judgments are made. Wisdom cries out, and she stands. And the question is, do we engage with godly wisdom at those intersecting points in life, or do we default to natural thinking? Wisdom chases after us every day, everywhere, wanting to be our friend, and we play hard to get. We play too busy. We play, we don't want to slow down and think and pray. We play like we're smarter. We play like we're strong. And we actually play dumb. 
We play dumb like, um, like I don't need to pay attention to that. Because also the personification of wisdom, the natural wisdom is chasing after us as well, desperately trying to engage us in all the natural patterns of the world. And that's why Ephesians 6, this idea is right there in Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. We're told we should put on the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The schemes of the devil. We put on the armor of God to stand against his schemes, that natural thinking. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There's something to be said for stopping and the need for God's protection and strength via his wisdom. Stopping and relying on that. This contrast, it creates a constant tension in life. It's the nature of the battle. Is, it is spiritual, as we just saw in those verses. Earthly, natural wisdom insists on fighting in according to the course of this world, by the world's rules, um, by all means natural, by all means necessary, doing things to maintain and keep control and power. And then it's not fought in where the, the actual battle is, is in the spiritual realm. That's where the sphere of the battle, that's where it is. That's where it takes place. And that's, those are the weapons that we need to fight it with, with righteousness, the righteousness of wisdom. We're like unarmed men. We're like um, in a battle of wits, we're unarmed men. And we're fighting the battle of wisdom, but we're not fighting it spiritually. That's what we need to be doing. All of our scheming, the scheme of things amounts to natural s- scheming and acting. By nature, we tend to ignore the spiritual, don't we? That's the, just our nature in everyday life. Relegating it to what Nacho Libre calls churchy stuff. You know, that's churchy stuff. We don't need to focus too much on that. And that's really how you become a religious man. And if you're familiar with the movie, he wants to become a real religious man. The problem is that um, religious people become pretenders because you try to uphold this thing and you refer to it as churchy stuff and you do that, that's not who you are. The last thing we want is pretenders. A religious people in name only, pretending is not wise James 3, 13 to 18, we see the wisdoms, these two wisdoms contrasted. It says, um, and what they look like. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. But it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. That's the result of natural wisdom, the world's wisdom, the course of this world. Verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits impartial and sincere and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace and jesus says in luke 7 wisdom is vindicated by her children the fruit of godly wisdom becomes obvious you see the 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 qualities of it there in the james passage so what does what does spiritual wisdom look like verse rather than the scheming pure Pure wisdom from God. It's described, interestingly, in three passages we're going to look at, three short passages in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, if you're familiar with it at all, it was a church. He's writing to a church, but a very carnal church. When we say the word carnal, very fleshy, not spiritual at all. Okay? That's their battle. They were stuck in so many uh, natural patterns of life and yet claiming to be following Christ. And so Paul is challenging them with this thinking about wisdom, what godly wisdom is. So in 1 Corinthians 2, 6 to 8, he says, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age, 
or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Seeing things as God sees them, obviously, they would not crucify the Lord of glory. But thinking the way the world thinks, they weren't able to see Jesus for who he was. 1 Corinthians 2 later, just um, uh, six verses later, in verse 14, he says, The natural person, the unregenerate person, the person who does not yet have the Spirit living in them or thinking like that, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. You know the part, you, you try to talk to somebody, it just doesn't make any sense, it doesn't click at all. It's just folly. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ, thinking, seeing differently than the natural. It is so important. And the irony, you know, you, you will often hear people make fun of people who act religious when they're actually being spiritual and wise. And the irony is, is that they're not being religious, they're being spiritual and they're showing godly wisdom, but they are the ones who are, who are made fun of. And lastly, uh, the, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 18 to 20, it says, no one, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. In other words, let him become, look like a fool to the world so that you can begin to understand. It's the beginning of true wisdom. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise man, that they are futile. The thoughts of the wise, the naturally wise man are futile. Seeking to please God to know God escapes. If you're seeking to please God, that's how you escape the snares of the natural wisdom. Simply put, we are to let spiritual wisdom catch us. It's chasing us. We need to let wisdom catch us and embrace us. We are to embrace wisdom like a friend. I want to show you a very quick video. Actually, we're going to show you two videos, but first this one, I, I just found it to be quite enlightening, so play the first video, the kids' video. Hey kids, in today's lesson, we're going to talk a little more about wisdom. In Proverbs 4, the author does a really funny thing. He talks about wisdom like it's a person. The adult word for this is personification. There's an important reason why he did this, so let's take a look. Wisdom can be your friend. Did you ever think of that? Wisdom is the thing we use to make good choices. So think of wisdom like your best friend that walks beside you at school, always there, ready to help. This is what our memory verse says. Don't turn your back on wisdom, for she will protect you. Love her, and she will guard you. It also says if we value and embrace her, she will make us great and honor us, and even give us a beautiful crown. That sounds like a pretty cool friend to have. So where do you find a friend like that? Your parents can introduce you to wisdom. You see, your parents and wisdom have been friends for a while, and your parents' job is to make wisdom your friend too. My child, listen to me and do as I say, and you will have a long, good life. I'll teach you wisdom's ways and lead you in straight paths. Your parents have known wisdom for a while, so they can teach you a lot. They want you to stay on the right path. And wisdom wants to be your friend to help you do that. So if you aren't friends with wisdom yet, I'm sure your parents would love to introduce you. And there's one last thing about our good friend wisdom. Wisdom will keep you on the right path. Just like your best friend, wisdom doesn't want to see you sad or in trouble. They want only the best for your life. 
and they want to steer you away from danger. Don't do as the wicked do, and don't follow the path of evil doers. Don't even think about it. Don't go that way. Turn away and keep moving. Evil people and evil things want to pull us away from God. They want to put us on a path that leads to some really bad stuff. But wisdom wants to keep us on God's path and help us to recognize danger when it comes our way. When we walk with wisdom, we choose to honor God and stay away from danger. So is wisdom your friend? Get to know her and she'll be your friend for life. Hey, wisdom. I love the kid who's just kind of like they're fidgety. But doesn't that teach us a lot as adults? I mean, probably if you're sitting there thinking, why are you playing kids talking to us? You're not thinking with spiritual wisdom. When Jesus said, you must become like a child in your faith, thinking simply about things. To me, this speaks a lot about wisdom and kids talking about it. Parents, are you ready for your kids to rely on you like that? Because they should, and they will. Are you preparing? It's the season you're in. Are you ready for it? As your kids grow, they're going to want to lean and rely on you for wisdom, for godly wisdom. Are you ready? Are you preparing yourself? It's another reason to embrace spiritual wisdom. Let it catch you. Experience embracing his wisdom in all seasons of life, in all circumstances. Let wisdom be your ever-present friend, the Holy Spirit alongside of you in, at every intersection. Whatever the season of life that you're in, accept it, not fatalistically, but accept it really for what it is, for what God wants it to be right now, in the here and now, in this season, and what God wants it to become. The changing landscape in your season of life is going to produce new opportunities, new opportunities for you to be used by God, for you to invest in the kingdom of God, if, if you're open to it and not stuck in the past. Old opportunities are in the past. They're not to be put on repeat and to keep thinking about it. Listen, our memories are what make us wealthy souls, the good memories, but we can't live there. God has more for us. Sometimes I think we, we kind of live, we go through life as generalities, but we have, we have the single life that we're living, then we get married before kids, then we're married with kids, and then all of a sudden, there's nothing in my nest. What am I going to do? Every one of those seasons, there's something very specific that God wants you to be doing and engaging in. But you can't just wait till every season to start preparing for it, right? It's an ongoing process to, to keep training. We need to be trained. We need to be trained in how to think and act with such wisdom, with godly wisdom, to be in, 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 in the flow of God's spirit. And we try to have a variety of training elements here at Hope. Variety as far as personal options. That's why we're trying to um, bump up the things that we have on the app for you to do personally. Small group options, large group options, obviously Sunday morning. But they all require, one thing they all require is, is personal initiative. You being intentional about how you're going to engage. One deep dive option for training and discipleship is the Colson Fellows Program for training in exactly this area. So watch this one minute video. You know, we live in extraordinary times. What the world needs perhaps more now than ever are men and women who are equipped in the ancient virtue of wisdom. Wisdom is, is, a, is an ability, it's a skill. It's the ability to discern what is true and good and beautiful. So many of the resources and, uh, that we provide at the Colson Center are designed to help the Christian know what they ought to think about a given issue. But for those that want to go deeper, the Colson Fellows Program teaches them how to think. The Colson Fellows Program is a 10-month course in which individuals uh, study what does it mean to live out a Christian worldview in their spheres of influence. A uh, cohort is a group of individuals in a region who are going through the program together. They are led by Commission Colson Fellows, 
and they meet monthly, typically on a Saturday morning, to engage the material so that you're not just in, ingesting the material yourself, but you're getting to talk through it with others who are participating with you. Here you get to see the body of Christ represented in the people that are in the cohort. So we had everything from an individual that was a convicted felon um, to someone who is a doctor who had at one time performed abortions. I recommend it. I've been recommending that to everyone I've come in contact with. It prepared me to be able to go out and engage wherever God have calls me to. So no matter what the next season brings or no matter what my next sphere of influence is, um, I have coherence within me and I have a strong understanding of, of who I am in Christ. And I'm able to bring that into whatever God calls me to. So I love how Michael referred to wisdom as an ancient virtue. You know, it is an ever-present friend, but it is an ancient virtue that we need to be trained in. The new cohort starts J July 1st, and we meet right here in this in his church downstairs. Um, and if you're interested in it, Scott and Betsy Natter have gone through the program. Jerry Williams has. Leanne Natter has. Um, and you can ask them what it's like. And I know some people have been thinking about it. But it's... Um, the only reason to go through that pro program is not by any stretch this, but many times people, especially when they get near retirement age, whatever that means, whatever that is, is they start to think, what am I going to do next? What am I going to do? How am I going to be equipped for that? And this becomes a good thing for that. But um, often retirement doesn't mean that you're done serving your king. You might be done t taking a salary, but God wants to use you I mean, until you breathe your last. That's his intention. I don't read about retirement at all in scriptures. I don't know. Do you? But. So I'm going to look at a couple of, of examples of wisdom um, in, in scripture. Examples of the tension between wisdom, uh, the two kinds of wisdoms, and why it's so important to be trained, and why it's so important to be able to have the right kind of reaction. In Acts chapter 4, there's a really great kind of confrontation that happens, um, and it's Peter and John are brought before the Sanhedrin again, reminiscent of when Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin, right? And they are, uh, they, they, they had just done a miracle. They raised a, a, a lame person who was 40 years, he couldn't walk, and raised him up. And the Sadducees, or the Pharisees and the Sadducees there said, now that when, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. They could see that that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing right beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. They admitted that. What can you say? There he is. It's obvious. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they confronted, they conferred with one another and said, what are we going to do with these men? Here they admit it. For a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all. And all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Now, that would be the time to yield. Spiritual wisdom would say, yield and admit it. Repentance. Yield to what you know is true. Now there's a big but. But, in order that, that it may spread no further, they told them, they warned them not to speak in this name anymore. They admitted all that had happened. They couldn't deny it. But in order to keep control, they, re they relied on earthly wisdom so they punished them and sent them away and they said don't speak they, they warned them again don't speak in the name of Jesus anymore and what was their response okay we'll do that no they said Peter and John said whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God you judge we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard knowing truth and acting on it regardless of the consequences that's heavenly wisdom, not earthly wisdom, right? You see the difference there, right? Another area is, you know, is prayer. I'm going to bring up prayer because, and this is not merely a critique about prayer. It's because um, I think what we do is we tend to get in natural ruts of prayer, natural ruts. We're praying, but we get in natural ruts. We think naturally. And what are the general topics that we tend to pray about when we, when we think? We, we tend to think of and pray about success, safety, and healing, right? You almost don't have to 
ask, what do you want me to pray for? You want those things to always be prayed for. Is that what we always pray for? It's like the default without thought prayer request. We know what they're going to be. So what's the point of prayer? Jesus said, your father knows what you're going to pray before you pray it, right? Maybe it should be pressing in to know God's knowns for us. In other words, what is God's particular wisdom in this circumstance, which takes more time, which takes pressing in and and listening, right? What are God's thoughts? What is the mind of Christ in this situation instead of just the default things we tend to pray, right? Wouldn't that sound more like spiritual wisdom of how to pray? Thinking God thoughts, God's thoughts after him. Listening, looking, reflecting. Things we tend to just think about and pray about, even things that just make us look better or feel better or others to feel better. Rather than praying for what might be the best things for his people, for me, for others, for the kingdom of God to advance. What would be those kinds of things to pray? That's clearly what Peter and John were responding. They were putting the kingdom first, not what, they, what made them comfortable. Actually, pr- praying like that is just exactly what Jesus told us not to do. And one other thing I just want to mention is uh, that today is St. Patrick's Day, right? Do we all know that? Do we care? I don't know. But it is St. Patrick's Day. Hey, you notice a fun fact about St. Patrick, or about Patrick. He wasn't Irish. Did you know that? He was born in England. He was born in England and abducted by Druids, Celtic Druids. And he became a shepherd's slave. And he escaped and was converted. He was converted and then he went and got trained. And where did he go after he got trained? He went back to Ireland to be a missionary to reach those who had, been, who had enslaved him. That's heavenly thinking, wisdom, not natural, right? That's really different thinking. And he didn't do that on a whim. The Druids were ones who practiced human sacrifice. And he was able to tell them about the one true God who gave his only son so that we would never have to do anything like that again. And thousands were saved. That's heavenly wisdom. That's heavenly type of thinking. And so the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us, it is the power of salvation. And so as we get toward the Easter season, let the word of the cross become our spiritual wisdom. It's thinking very differently than the word, than the world tends to think. Let's allow the wisdom of God to catch up to us and to catch us and to embrace us so that we can embrace him and live our lives. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we pray that we would be able to embrace spiritual wisdom, godly wisdom, as an ever-present friend, to do things that we know we should do to prepare uh, to better serve you, to better serve others. And may we prioritize, may we seek first your kingdom, knowing that all these other things are going to be added to us. Seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. May your Holy Spirit give us the power to discern godly wisdom from natural wisdom. And may we be able to more clearly be able to discern and choose to do what is right rather than what is easy. In Jesus' name, amen.